text this morning is James chapter 1, and we'll look in verse 2. James chapter 1, verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Now, if you're a Christian, then you have upon your back or somewhere, you have a target. And that target is your faith. The devil wants to attack it. Uh, he's going to come after your faith, and he's going to come after your faith through trials and tribulations and testing. And the Lord is going to uh, also test and try your faith, and he's going to prove it and demonstrate it, and he's going to perfect it. And your faith is going to be tried. And since God wants to perfect his children, he says here, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. You know, if you're a Christian, God wants to perfect your faith. And so he says in this text, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, because these, uh, these trials are going to be for your good. I want to look this morning at some of these things. First, we're going to point out that temptation is a trial of your faith. Our text says in uh, verse uh, 2, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Faith is the mark of a Christian. Faith is dependence upon God. It is reliance upon Him. It is uh, surrender to Him and commitment to Him. It is the mark of every true and genuine Christian. And since this is the case, the devil would like to attack it. Uh, turn, if you will, to 1 Peter chapter 1, which should be just one book over from James to the right. 1 Peter <laughs> chapter 1. And I want you to... Listen to this verse from 1 Peter chapter 1. It says this in verse 7, That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that your faith is precious. It's very precious. It's precious to us. It's more valuable than gold. It's tried by fire. Uh, it is something that is uh, a work in progress that needs to be uh, perfected and, and worked on, and so they put that metal into the to the to the kiln, and they they heat it up, and they get out the, the impurities. This is what God is doing with our faith; it needs it. God wants to perfect our faith, and so because our faith is precious, and because it's more precious than gold that perishes, and because it is something that is found to the praise and honor of God, the devil wants to attack it. And so we'll point out a few reasons why the devil wants to attack it. But first of all, as it said in that passage of Scripture, it brings glory and honor to God. You know, it's the chief end of man to bring honor to God, to, on, to glorify Him and, and worship Him forever. And since it is your chief end as a human being and in your existence to glorify God, whatever would bring us to uh, that, uh, that end, whatever will take us there, is something we should thank God for, but it is also going to be attacked by the devil. God doesn't want, the devil doesn't want God to get glory. He doesn't want God to be honored and glorified. And so we need to recognize that the trials and temptations and, and the difficulties, they help us meet the end to which we're created. They help us to accomplish the end for which God made you, and that is to bring praise and honor and glory to God. And since you have been created to bring glory and honor to God. Anything that promotes that end, we should rejoice in it because we are, being fulfill we are fulfilling our purpose in life. And we're fulfilling the end to which we are created to bring glory and honor to God. So the devil wants to attack it because he doesn't want God to get glory. And so the devil's going to be attacking our faith. He also attacks it because uh, we're saved and delivered by faith from sin. You know, sin is uh, the life of the soul. The Bible says the just shall live by faith, and so we walk by faith and not by sight. And we go through this life, and we get from the beginning of our Christianity to the end of our Christianity by faith. And then when we die, all things will be revealed, will be made to see, and we'll see Christ as He is. And we'll no longer walk by faith, but we will be in, He'll be in our sight, 
and we'll be able to live in his presence. But until then, we walk by faith, having not seen him, yet we, we rejoice in him and we love him. And so we are looking at faith as that thing that's like the, the life in the soul, and the devil would like to put that out. He is, we see that faith is like the fire that's in the hearth, and, and it warms the whole body. The Bible says without faith, the body is dead. Uh, just like the soul, it's like without the um, soul, the body is dead. So without faith, the Christian is dead. And so Satan wants to strike at our faith because if he strikes our faith, he strikes the very life of our Christianity, and he strikes a death blow to the Christian. And therefore, our faith is what he wants to extinguish. Our faith is what he wants to put away from us because it is life. And so that, that uh, faith is, is uh, essential to our Christianity. You know, he also attacks our faith because uh, in the scriptures, if you want to read Hebrews chapter 11, you'll see that the many men did many wonderful things by faith. There were uh, the walls of Jericho falling down, and Moses crossing through the Red Sea, and, and uh, there were exploits done by Christians who loved the Lord, and they did these things by faith. And since our faith is what was enabled these men to, uh, to do these wonderful things, the devil knows that if he attacks your faith, he'll keep you from some of those wonderful things yourself. He'll keep you from some of those exploits, from those heroic deeds will not be done by you if your faith is in shambles. And so he attacks. Uh, you know, a Christian without his faith is like Samson when he got his hair cut off. He lost all his strength. He lost all his capacity to do the work of the Holy Spirit that he had come upon him to do. And so he had his hair cut off. And, and when we lose our faith, it's like Samson, weak and just as any ordinary man. With our faith, we're like that Samson. He had strength beyond degree. He had uh, the ability to do things no other men could do. And he was unstoppable. Now Satan doesn't want us to be conquered. He wants us to be failures. He wants us to be losers. He doesn't want us to be conquerors. And since he wants us to fail, he knows if he attacks our faith, then he can have us. And he can destroy us. And so he attacks that faith. The Bible says there are diverse temptations. When you fall into diverse temptations, these are numerous temptations. The trial of, uh, and temptations are trials of your faith. And they're numerous. He wants to attack it in numerous ways, but they're going to vary by each person. You know, every person's got their own, uh, uh, own testing, and God sends trials and testings our way. You know, Abraham, he had to go up on that mountain and sacrifice his son Isaac. And so he, in faith, went up on the side of the mountain, and, and he took the wood and the fire, and he didn't take an offering. And Isaac said to his father, where is the offering? And, and Abraham said, God will provide himself a lamb. And so they went up on that uh, hill, and by faith he offered. Uh, he he, he um, was delivered from having to offer Isaac, but he went and he he was tested, and he prevailed in the over the, in the test. He passed the test, but you're not going to be tested that way. That was a one-time test, and that test was for Abraham, and he's going to test you in different ways. And and nobody's testing is the same. Everybody's tested differently. And since your testing is going to be different, then uh, you are going to have to recognize that uh, everybody's test is also very real. You know, the devil's going to come and he's going to try to trip you and try to destroy you and he's going to try to, uh, to injure you. And in doing so, he is going to uh, give a test to you that is, is unique to you. And so the Bible teaches us here that we're to, um, we're to rejoice when you fall into diverse temptations and, and trials. But these temptations and trials are for our good. And we need to recognize that uh, each trial and testing is going to be for the individual. Now what will happen, see, is every, since everybody's testing is individual, you will not be tripped up by somebody else's test. You won't see their, their temptation as very difficult or very, uh, very, very, um, uh, uh, very e something easily for you to fall to. And so we're likely to be judgmental. And we're likely to look down on someone who fell to something so easy or simple. And that's not the case. You see, the devil knows how to trip you. And so since he knows how to trip you, 
and uh, he knows how he can get you, then your trial is not my trial, and my trial is not your trial, and you need to respect that everybody has their own weaknesses, constitutionally and physically, and, and in their own experience, and, and we have to be careful how we see other people and have mercy in our hearts towards the difficulties that other people have. And so we can't look down upon someone because they fell to something that uh, we would not have fallen to, or they're tempted and tried by something that is nothing for us. You see, God knows, and the devil even tries to send something to you that's going to trip you. Notice that uh, it says, uh, let's see, my uh, count all joy and you fall into various trials, knowing that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And we know that these uh, trials, they're also called temptations, and we know that temptations can lead to sin. Temptations can lead to sin. The natural tendency is to bring trouble, and that trouble induces us to sin. And therefore, since there's um, a, a natural tendency in trials to cause us to sin, um, we need to, to uh, ask the Lord to give us strong faith so that when the trials come, we don't fall to the sin. You know, God is using these things to create graces in your heart. Graces like mercy and, and forgiveness and tenderness and kindness and, and uh, strong faith. But these are graces that when we possess them, they don't just show up one day and you become kind and gentle and, and Christ-like. Graces, uh, someone said, they never make it to heaven in silver slippers. They have to be tried and tested and perfected all along the way through trials and difficulties and temptations. And since they are, uh, they are to, um, we're to relish the fact that they are going to uh, be tested, that they're going to be perfected. He says here, be uh, to brethren, count all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. You know, these are things that people fall into. These temptations are things that are fallen into, like a trap, like a trick, like a snare. They uh, come at us quickly. You remember Job, he was, um, he was, he was there and, and his servant ran up to him and said, all of your children have been uh, destroyed. All of, and then another servant runs up to him before he's finished speaking, he says, all your, all your livestock has been taken. And another servant runs up to him, he tells him all these things that have happened to him. And one after the other, these trials just came upon Job, one after the other. And they were great difficulties to him. And they were um, temptations to sin. They were, they were a, uh, a, 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 they had a tendency in him to cause him to, to curse God. But he, he passed the test. And the reason is because he recognized that these things had come from God. And he said, naked came I into the world, and naked shall I return. He had nothing when he came here, and he knew all things were from God. But wouldn't it be happy on our parts if the faith that God calls a shield, a shield of faith, was able to withstand all of the enemy's darts, all of the enemy's attacks? Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing for us if we are able, by God's grace, to withstand the attacks of the enemy. Count it all joy if you can, but that is going to happen through a process. It's going to happen through time and testing. Now there's a great blessing to be gained by the, faith, by the trial of our faith. We see that temptation and testing is a trial of our faith, but there's a great blessing to be gained from that. And the first thing is that our, our faith is really tried and proven through these testings, so that when we go through them, our faith comes out better. Our, our faith must be proven. And when can we say that a soldier is a good soldier? Uh, he goes through boot camp, and they, they train him how to use his gun, and they train him how to fight, and they take him to, um, to uh, training, and they, they learn to fight. But you know, a soldier can be called a good soldier after he's been to the battlefield, and, and he's done well. You think of a think of a ship, and you think, uh, well, will this ship sail? Will it be will it be seaworthy? Well, you can talk to an engineer who built it, and you can survey the ship and see that it looks good. But really, you don't know until you put it in the water, and it's had some difficult waters, and it stood up the test of the waves beating against it and the storm coming. And same thing with a home. If you look at a home, and you think, is this home built strong? Is it is it capable of withstanding the great storms? And, 
And so you don't really know until a storm comes and blows up on the house and, and shakes the house and rattles the house. And after a long and hard shaking and storm, then the house stands. And you say, yes, this house is built to last. It's, got, it, it's a strong house. And that's how it is with our faith. It must be proven. We can talk about faith and we can, we can use uh, a language about what our faith is like, but it needs to be tested. And our faith will be strong and we'll have that confidence in our faith once we've seen the test and we've been through the test and the test has proven our faith to be true. Uh, you can consider in the scripture, because you know, we, we think about these tests and they're hard. We, we'd like for God to bless us and Often we pray, oh Lord, you know, give me this blessing and, and help me to feel close to you and, and uh, nourish me and strengthen me. And I want you to think about the Ark of the Covenant. Inside the Ark of the Covenant was the Ten Commandments. And also in the Ark of the Covenant was the rod and the manna. And the rod and the manna were, went together uh, side by side there in the Ark because God was figuring for us that His provision includes for us the, the necessary provisions for our sustenance, for our life, our health, and our strength, but also the rod and the chastening, and it comes together. We, come, we get from God His love and compassion, and so He gives to us both the food that we need and the provisions that we need and the, the blessings that we need, and He also gives us the chastening that we need and the discipline that we need in order to perfect us. And so we see this picture in the Ark of the Covenant that uh, God is blessing us by providing the manna and He's also blessing us by providing the rod, the correction. And we need both. We don't need one or the other. We don't need to be all correction and we don't need to be all blessings. We need to have both. We need to have a love and a firm hand. And as parents, we do the same thing. We discipline our children and we feed them and clothe them and care for them. And if we only clothed them and, and cared for their physical needs, we would do them a disservice. And we need to be have to have a strong discipline side to our, our time with the Lord. But we see that uh, this manna was there next to the rod and God provides for us in this life both the things that we need, the blessings that we need, and He provides for us the chastening. And so we need to count it all joy when we fall into various trials and diverse temptations because God is using both the manna and the rod in our, in our life. And we often ask that God would give us something special, that He would bless us, that we feel closer to Him, and that we feel nourished by His hand, but we need to thank Him for the rod as well. We need to thank Him for the chastening as well. We need to thank Him for the hard times and for the difficulties and for the tears and for the broken hearts because those are things that God is doing side by side in His love for you, both blessing you with His presence and then touching you with that rod in order to perfect you and strengthen you. Turn with me to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. John, can you put that book in your lap and sit up? Thank you. Romans chapter 5. And that uh, is, um, let's see, I think we're going to read, start reading in verse 2. And Romans chapter 5 says, By whom also we have access by faith into the, this grace, wherein you stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we also glory in tribulations also. Knowing that the tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope make not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. The scripture here points out that we have to be tried and tested, and when we have this trial and testing, it produces a great hope in our heart and a love for God, and the hope rest, gives us a rest and an assurance that our love for God is real. When you can submit to the rod, then you are showing the love of God in your heart. It sheds abroad our heart the, the, the patience that's produced by the uh, discipline and by the chastening shows us a great hope that our hope, our, our Christianity is genuine, that we love the Lord and 
that all things are real. Uh, not only does it um, uh, not only does it give us hope, but it also proves the validity of our doctrine. You know, we believe certain things. And you, you believe that Jesus is God and that He died for sinners and that He paid the way for us to be saved. But uh, we recognize that those are words and, you know, words can be just an idle profession. They can be empty, they can be an empty words that you, you know what they mean, but you don't really believe them in your heart. But... When the trial comes, and the testing comes, and you pass through it, and you're able to, um, uh, to move from just idle words to the, the assurance that, uh, that, this, uh, that these testings produce, it produces in you a great hope and an assurance that is going to last. Uh, you can say, I was tried, I was tested by God, and I, I prevailed with God because my faith found its resting place in Christ. And because my faith was tried, and because I came out glorifying the Lord, I see that my words were not just mere words, but they reflected the genuineness of my heart. And so God uses these trials to prove the validity of our doctrine. You know, it even proves that our faith is from God. The, it, there are great benefits to testing, and one of them is that it proves that our our, our faith has come from God. Now you, you came across an adversity. The adversity came upon you and it came hard and fast upon you. And what did you do? You clang, clung to Christ. You clung to Jesus. Because your faith was from heaven. And the Holy Spirit directed you to hold your integrity. And to live in a way that pleases the Lord. And you said, oh Lord, I don't want to depart from you in this in this uh, affliction that I'm carrying on, that's coming upon me. And you cried unto God, and you, you asked the Lord to preserve you from sin, and He did. And you can see that that's the work of the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit is to preserve us from sin. That's one of His jobs. And so when we, we see this happening in our own heart, we recognize that God is at work in us. It says, count it all joy. Count it all joy because of the suffering that you're going through proves that your heart is genuine, that you have a real genuine Christian testimony. Now, we need to learn how to count it all joy. We need to learn how to count. What he's saying here, count. I want you to look at that word, count. You go back to the book of James. We're there in uh, James chapter uh, 1. He says, count it all joy. You know, when you're counting something as joy, what you're saying is that uh, we're going to mark it up as joy. We're going to put it in the joy column. We're going to take it and we're going to take this, uh, uh, this item and we're going to put it under the list, under the heading of joy. So he's really te teaching us that we don't count correctly. See, we count difficulties and trials as burdens to bear. We count them as difficulties to handle. We count them as something to go through and pass out of, and the sooner the better. But he says count them and reckon them as joy. So we really we don't count correctly. We don't know how to count. We don't know how to, um, to have good perspective on the things that are happening to us. But what we need to do is count them as joy. And put them in the, the joy column. Put them under the column in the heading that says, this is a, one, a good thing that's happening to me. And, of course, the reason is because of all the benefits that are going to come from it. We're not looking at the joy of the situation, but we're looking at the joy from the situation. We're looking at the joy from the faith that is going to be perfected, from the faith that is going to be um, grown and strengthened. We're going to see that we have all this hope and assurance that comes out of it. We're going to see that the Holy Spirit works in us and blesses us. And so we look at those things as joy. You know, a lot of times we see the suffering that we go through as just another day of difficulty and hardship. And of course, we look to the time when there'll be no suffering, and that's a, a wonderful thing. But in the meantime, how is God going to perfect me? How is God going to perfect you? How is He going to take you and make you into the person He wants to make you? He's going to do it through trials and tribulations and suffering and temptations are going to beset you. This is what we need to learn how to count. We need to learn how to count, count it. 
as joy, not for the trial itself, but for the end that it produces in our hearts. Now there's a great virtue that comes from this, and that there are great virtues that come from it, and one of them, as we read, is patience. In James chapter 1, it says, But let patience have her perfect work. So now we recognize that the patience is the product of our trial, of our faith being tested. Patience. Now we all need patience. Everybody needs more patience. Since we have um, a need of patience, and we gain that patience through testing, we need to count it joy that we're being tried and tested because we'll be able to have more patience. Uh, the Bible teaches us here that patience is gained through the testing, and it means that we're going to be tested and learn how not to murmur. We're going to be tested and we're going to be learning how not to murmur through our trials. Uh, the soul comes to a submission to the will of God. You know what we do when we look into our soul is we see oftentimes that there are two wills. There's the will of God, and then there's the will of our own heart. And we would like to get to the place where there's not two wills anymore, but there's just one will. That's the Lord's will. And how is that going to happen? You know, children don't become obedient overnight. We don't find that uh, there's some magic secret that we come across where instantly our children become obedient. It takes time. It takes energy. It takes discipline. It takes um, uh, doing the right thing over and over, and they become disciplined. Babies don't uh, wean overnight. It takes some time. It takes some crying. It takes some difficulty. It takes some saying no to them, and eventually they're weaned, but it takes a little time. And you know, you and I are not going to become a patient overnight. We're going to become patient through trials, and we must desire to become patient and desire to have the will of God. We gain the ability from these trials to bear the uh, ill treatment, the slander, the injury that comes across us, and we get to do it without resentment like Christ, who, when he was reviled, he didn't revile in return. And we are, have a patience that's produced in us that's a, that becomes a very beautiful thing. Uh, we gain the ability to wait. We gain the ability to wait. You know, we, we, uh, or we begin praying for people to be saved, and, and through the testing and the trials, we have to wait and wait sometimes for their conversion. But we're taught to wait, and patience is a good thing. We're taught to wait as our trials may be extended. You know, it's a frustration for us when we pray, because we often pray that our trials will end, and we need to pray and be prepared if in case our trials are extended. Because God may want to extend it and will gain by that suffering. God would want maybe to bless us by creating more patience in us. By extending our trials rather than shortening them. And we need to be really willing and ready to receive from God's hand whatever it is He desires. And from that, of course, that patience and that waiting, we're going to gain endurance. We're going to gain endurance. God is blessing us with patience, and we're enduring. Uh, that, uh, uh, you, you know, you, you think of uh, some people like myself, I get out there and I work in the sun. And I start, uh, usually sometime in the spring, it starts to get hot, and here in Florida it gets up to about uh, 90. It's in the, with the heat index, it's often over 100 degrees every day. And you go out at 7 o'clock in the morning, 8 o'clock in the morning, there's no breeze, and there's just heat coming on all day long. And then the sun shines, and, and it bakes on you all day, and it bakes long and hard. And, you know, it takes two or three or four weeks sometimes to really adjust to that. And sometimes people come out, and they speak to me, and they'll say, I don't know how you guys work out here in this heat. And the answer to that is not that uh, we have some special... Um, a capacity to take additional heat. The, the reason that we're able to do that is because we spent so much time in the heat, it darkens up your skin, 
and your skin begins to be able to handle the, the, the hotter uh, sun shining on you. Uh, it uh, causes you to have a, hot, a faster metabolism and you process the fluids better. And, and so you begin, your body begins to change and to adjust and it takes time. And since it takes time, it's not something that can be done overnight, but your body begins to have an endurance that it did not have before. It takes a few weeks and sometimes a few months really to be able to have that endurance and the muscles be able to continue. Uh, this is not something that you can learn from a book. It's not something that you can just pick up a book and say, okay, here's how to deal with the heat and then read it and be able to sustain a full day of work in the sunshine because you read some things that you need to do. It takes time for your skin to darken. It takes time for your body uh, blood to thin out. It takes time for your, uh, your, your respiratory uh, capacity to increase and your muscles to strengthen and you to be able to carry the tools. And it takes time and time and time for that to happen. Same with testing. It takes time for you to gain endurance. It takes time for you to gain patience. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to happen over the course of time. And therefore, we need to thank God that He's being patient with us, and He's guiding us, and He's helping us. But there's last, one last point, and that is there's still a greater good that comes from testing. Look in our passage. It says, let patience have her perfect work, verse 4, that she, that she may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. There is a perfection, a spiritual completeness that is being aimed at by God and He is seeking your spiritual good and your spiritual best. He says, count it all joy because there's spiritual good that comes from it. Patience is one. But He speaks here of spiritual perfection. He speaks of that completeness, that uh, well-rounded ripeness that would come from the time of your trials. And so count it joy because the best gain is yet to come from these trials. You think about what things are good for somebody to gain. Somebody, let's say they become, they have, they have, uh, they've done well with their uh, fi financially speaking. They've done well. They've, they've got a good house and they've, they've got a, uh, they've got plenty of money in the bank. And, and you say, well, that's good for them. They've done very well for themselves. But imagine if that person were very sickly, and they had all those things, but they were, they were not healthy. You say, well, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be a good thing. And so what would you rather have, lots of money and be really sickly and near death, or would you rather have your health and not so much of the, of the world's goods? You know, most people would rather be healthy and strong and vigorous and be able to enjoy life than to have lots and lots of money. And therefore, we look at life and we say, well, the things that are closest to the, to the man, those really are the things that they value the most. And so if somebody was very healthy and strong, and yet their hearts were breaking and they were miserable inside, we say, well, I wouldn't want to be healthy and strong just to be miserable. Why, the things that get closest to the man, those are the best things. And so I would prefer to be the man who's happy on the inside. The, the man who has peace and is settled and has a peace that is not passing away, but has holiness and, and uh, purity and strength of character. Those are the best things. The trials are the only things that can produce the best things in our lives. The trials are the only things that can produce the most precious things in our lives. And that is why we count them joy, because they're so good and they're so precious to us we are able to have in our hearts the best things from the trials. Trials are what find our weak points and make them stronger. You know, sickness, you get sick and you, you, you go through a time of sickness and it ends up making you kinder and more gentle. Uh, you, you go through a loss and it causes you to have uh, more compassion on other people because of a loss that you've had. You have tears in your eyes and a broken heart and it causes you to be more forgiving to the next person that you meet. You go through failure in your personal life and then you are able to look at someone else and be more, uh, to be less judgmental towards them. 
and you're able to be more understanding. You go through chastening, and it causes you to be humble, and it causes you to speak of the Savior more, and, and speak of His goodness, and it causes you to be less in your own eyes, because you've been through chastening. And you're able to speak about the good things that the Lord has done for you. And you speak about how He brought you through and how He changed your heart and how He perfected you. And uh, you see less and less of yourself and more and more of the Savior. And, you know, when you've been through certain things, it's a easy to be able to be calm. You know, we've, we've, if you've ever uh, been on a boat or something and and it gets real stormy out, or this, the boat begins to rock, or if you've uh, been through it with someone who's uh, drive, drives in the storm and they're used to it, then a lot of times what you'll see is that the people, other people become very nervous and anxious about how things are going to turn out. But there's often one person who's been through it a number of times and they say, don't worry, we're going to make it through just fine, everything's going to be okay. I've been, been, been through this many times before and everything's going to be okay. So the person who's been through the storm, the person who's been through the, the trials, the person who's been through the troubles, they are the calm ones. They're the ones who are able to make it and, and make it with great peace. They've done it before, they've seen it happen, and they're able to pass along this confidence. And that's going to be what happens to you when you've been through trials, you've been through tribulations, you're going to be able to be calm. The Lord is perfecting your faith. Now, if you want to have your virtues developed, you're going to have to go through the troubles, the tribulations, the various temptations that come, that come to men by virtue of God wanting to try us. Now, the Bible says God does not tempt any of us to evil. There is in temptation, there is in these testings, a temptation to sin, but God's end is not to tempt us to do evil, but to teach us to do right. And so if we fall to evil, it's not because God is tempting us. The devil might be tempting us, but the Lord doesn't try to get us to do evil. He's trying to get us to do right. And the Lord is here to perfect you. So count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Because if you want to be perfected in Christ, it is the only way. So the Lord is going to send trials your way. You're going to be tempted. You're going to be tested and you need to take those joys and look and count, learn how to count them as joys. Learn how to count that these things genuinely are things that will make my soul and spirit better. They're going to make me more Christ-like. And I'm going to be able to count them as joy. Because although it is difficult to go through, the end produced far exceeds the difficulty that I'm suffering. That spiritual completeness, that spiritual ripeness, that fruit of perfection. That's the only way to get that is to go through the trials. So I want to encourage you today to count your trials as joys. Is life tough? Is life hard? Do you have difficulties? Do you have tears? Do you have loneliness? Do you have problems? Count them as joy and allow the Lord to show you that this is an opportunity for you to say to the Lord, now Lord, Show your strength to me. Because when I'm weak, that's when you're strong. That shield of faith, raise it high today. And let, the, let them quench those fiery darts of the wicked one. And say to the Lord, Lord, this trial of my faith is an opportunity for me to see that genuinely I have been saved. And that the Holy Spirit of God is in control. And I want you to rule my life and, and guide me. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, what an opportunity we have before us to submit patiently in trial and to come out having been made patient, having been made hopeful, having been made complete in our Christian life. I pray, Lord, that you would take us through the trials, through any temptations, and by faith we would win the victory, and we would conquer Satan, and we would overcome the world. Because faith is the victory, Lord, that overcomes, and Jesus Christ is our great captain. And you go before us, Lord, and I thank you for all the tempting and the testing, and I pray that uh, we will see that this battle must be won. And not only must it be won, but it may, can be won in such a way that you bring, uh, you receive glory and praise and honor through the trial of our faith. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.